Okay, good evening. Uh, this is the LaRouche Pack Saturday Night Class. Uh, I'm Mike Steger. Um, and tonight we're going to have a special guest, Bob Ingram. And this is part of, in some ways, our, our kind of last few weeks dialogue on culture. But I think maybe appropriately, Bob's going to address the, these, this question of culture and how much our language uh, just as just an aside on my part, how much our language has been kind of programmed by propaganda efforts to turn words into kind of labels, where in an, in an attempt to replace thought. Because when we think about culture, it's, it becomes a much bigger question. And so given um, what is a very dramatically developing stage of the presidential election and really the fight for our country. Um, and in some sense, we're gonna, I think Trump is speaking at a CNN town hall this week, where we see a breakdown of the, the political party or partisan hold on our nation's political dialogue. I think Bob's contributions are gonna be apropos to help shape and situate so we have a deeper quality of thinking within our population and citizenry and perhaps most of all, a sense of optimism and having fun in such a remarkable moment. So with that, Bob, I'm going to hand it over to you and um, let you take it away. Okay. Hello, folks. Uh, but make sure you unmute first. I am. I am unmuted. Can you hear me? Uh, now I can hear you. Great. Yeah, go ahead. Um, hello, folks. Um, I'm sort of pinch hitting tonight. Miwa Steger was scheduled. Uh, uh, for, you know, a, a, a couple of classes, uh, which I think people will find very, very provocative. Uh, but uh, an emergency came up, so I am sitting in for her. And, um, you know, my uh, my goal tonight is, is somewhat modest, um, but uh, I think we can get some uh, good discussion um, as a result of what I'm going to present. Now, I'll just begin by saying that uh, I recently authored and published on the LaRouche Pack website an article entitled, Can the Approaching Dark Age Be Reversed? Um, that was posted on uh, May 1st, just five days ago, and it's available for everyone on this call to, uh, to view and to read. Um, I'll repeat the title. Can the approaching dark age be reversed? Um, now, I'm not going to um, try to uh, go through everything that's in that article tonight, but that is sort of the theme that uh, I want to pursue here. Um, you know, because uh, there's a lot of chatter right now. I mean, obviously. Uh, you know, there's a, a, a you know a, a, an enormous focus that is you know developing, and it's going to only increase in the months ahead uh, on the 2024 presidential election. Um, you know, there's people posting articles and this and that, and there's all kinds of news things on all of these news aggregator sites and that kind of thing, and a lot of chatter about the 2024 election. Some more thoughtful you know, uh, essays and others on the 2024 election. Um, but, you know, uh, in my view, um, almost all of this, with perhaps a glimmer of reality here and there, but almost all of this discussion is just woefully inadequate um, and uh, uh, does not at all uh, take, it doesn't seem to recognize at all the nature of the uh, crisis that we are in. Um, you know, the, uh, I mean, people know a lot of the bad things that are going on, um, you know, but th the reality is that we are in a civilizational crisis. You know, we are, we are at the point of a co the collapse of an imperial system. Um, and, you know, if you restrict what you're doing, to a discussion of individual issues, you know, single issues, um, 
it's just not adequate. It, 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 you know, th there is no way that we can win. There is no way that we can turn this situation around by people insisting on, you know, individual single issues. Now, one of the things that I reference in my article uh, is, um, uh, you know, his frequent statement, which he made from time to time, that, uh, um, uh, you know, that the history of the human species is essentially a history of failed civilizations, of failed empires, failed oligarchical systems, which collapsed. And oftentimes, such a collapse would result in a, a long period of human human misery, you know what we're, you know what are sometimes called dark ages. I mean, you saw that after the collapse of the Roman Empire, but you know there have been many such, uh, you know, um, catastrophic collapses of human society, um, you know, over many millennia. Uh, in the history of the human species. Uh, and this is true in Asia and Africa and elsewhere. Uh, and we're not just talking about um, about Europe. Um, and um, now, you know, a lot of people view this from the standpoint that, uh, well, this is how things work. You know, a country rises, it has its period of dominance, and then it recedes or collapses, you know, like uh, like the Roman Empire, like the British Empire, uh, like other things of that type. Um, and um, <clears throat> certain dynasties in China, for instance. And that this is sort of like a cycle, uh, a cycle which is repeated over and over again. And that really that's just how things are. That's how history works. Well, that is not how Lyndon LaRouche viewed it, because the, the point that he made is that uh, what you are really dealing with here is an oligarchical principle, and that's the term he gave it. He said that societies and cultures which are governed by an oligarchical principle are doomed to destruction. That doesn't mean all societies are doomed to destruction, but it means that societies governed by an oligarchical principle, an oligarchical view of human nature are doomed to destruction, doomed to self-destruction. Um, and the, uh, uh, you know, and, um, I mean, Lynn, Lynn discussed this at really in depth at quite some length in many, many of the things that he wrote. Um, and, you know, the, the question arises, if you look at these collapses in human history, collapse of the Roman Empire, or if you look at what happened in uh, Italy specifically, but in Europe more generally, in the uh, 14th and early 15th century, um, with the depopulation of Europe, the Black Death, the collapse of the entire economic system, um, uh, you know that in 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 you know when we when the human race or different cultures around the world have gone through this, uh, you know, a period of civilizational collapse, um, you know, it has usually taken decades, centuries, or multiple centuries to recover from such a collapse, um, to begin anew, you know. Uh, and, you know, the question I ask in my article is do we have to do that i mean is that our fate you know are we doomed to that sort of fate 
because we we are in the midst now of a civilizational crisis and a civilizational collapse. I mean, if we if we keep on the path that we're on, there's really only two alternatives, and they are not somewhere in the distant future. We are facing this now. We are facing this in the weeks or months ahead. You know, I, I, and the uh, um, uh, and if we stay on this path, I, I mean, there's there's only two possible path. You know, all, you know, two possible branches of this path we're going to go down. One is a global financial and economic breakdown, um, the magnitude of which has never been witnessed before. And this will be accomp accompanied by economic chaos, the total breakdown of production, and likely mass starvation. That's one path. Uh, you know, and the, the other path is uh, World War III. And the only question really is, is which path are we going to, are we going to go down? You know, uh, which alternative is it that's going to come first? That's if we stay, you know, on, on, on the overall pathway that we're on, if nothing changes. I mean, you could do this, you could do that. And I'm not saying this to, to, to belittle any of these things. But, you know, you could take CRT out of the schools. You could have, you know, um, do this or do that. You could have mail-in, I mean, uh, you know, paper ballots for voting. You, you could do a lot of things, many of which are good and some of which are extremely important. But you could do all of those things. But if we do not get off the path we're on as a nation and really as a species, but particularly, we're, you know, this is a podcast primarily for Americans, uh, if we do not get off the path that we're on, um, none of that is going to matter. Um, the um, Now, what I want to do is just to sort of make it a little graphic um, as to the type of crisis we're creating, you know, that we're living through right now. I, I, I want to just briefly reference two sort of topical things. Um, um, the first thing I want to do is, uh, I want to, you know, I, I want to bring up, you know, uh, the kind of misery and pessimism that is spreading across the country. And I want to, um, use as a, uh, sort of an example of this, uh, you know, uh, the city, uh, Gary, Indiana. Now, uh, some people are familiar with Gary. They may know that at one time, um, Gary, Indiana, this is during the 1950s, uh, uh, 1960s, into even into the you know early 1970s, Gary, Indiana was the steel producing capital of the United States of America. It was steel town. Um, more so than Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, you know, it was it was the center of steel production in the United States. In 1970, Gary had 180,000 people, of whom 30,000 were steel workers. Now, most of those steel workers had families, had children, so you know, mi you know, minimally a majority of the families, a majority of the actual total population in Gary uh, were dependent upon and, and, and participating in the steel industry. It was a prosperous middle-class town with families uh, and, you know, all the other kinds of things you can think of in, in you know, that existed, say, in 1960, the year that John Kennedy was elected. Um, today, Gary has 67,000 people, 180,000 in 1960, 67,000 today. Um, uh, the, um, you know, it's, it's lost 60% or more of its population. 
there are only 4,500 steelworkers left in Gary. Went from 30,000 to 4,500. Uh, the city is flooded, literally flooded uh, with um, drugs, fentanyl, and other, you know, illegal drugs. 54% um, of children, 54% of children live below the poverty line. Um, it has the second highest murder rate in the United States um, for cities uh, over 50,000 people. Um, uh, the main library was closed down. Most of the schools have been closed down. You know, it's a hellhole. Now, Gary is not alone in this depiction because you could travel through the United States, uh, you know, particularly in what, you know, people euphemistically refer to as the Rust Belt. Um, you could travel through the United States and you could find dozens and dozens, hundreds of small towns, medium-sized towns, even somewhat larger cities, um, you know, which are in the same condition, the same situation. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, people, when they think about the urban crisis, they tend to focus on, you know, places like Chicago, you know, Baltimore, Detroit, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, that's all true you know, in terms of the crime and the drugs and everything else. But, you know, shift your focus away from the big cities and look at what has happened to the heart and soul of the nation, to the productive workforce across the nation in hundreds and hundreds of towns, villages, cities, communities, etc. Uh, it's being destroyed. Now, you know, um, you know, now one of the things, you know, one of the debates that's come up in this presidential campaign, you know, uh, you know, one of the things that's being talked about now on these various websites by these various, you know, I don't know, commentators, uh, you know, um, uh, is, uh, you know, that the, you know, is a debate about tactics you know, in the presidential campaign, you know, should we focus on cultural issues, you know, the Trump campaign, should we focus on cultural issues like transgenderism and, you know, things like this, abortion, et cetera, et cetera, or should we focus on, you know, bread and butter economic issues? And, you know, there's this big kerfuffle about it, big discussion about it. Now, you know, the, you know, it is my view that this entire debate is ridiculous. It's phony. It makes no sense at all because what, what it's not looking at is the way in which really the entire culture of our nation and families across the nation are just being destroyed. Now, you know, you can't take out the economic issue. That's impossible. Because if you look at a place like Gary, or if you look at many of these other cities, or, you know, you know, many of these places, you know, Flint, Michigan, for instance, or a lot of these places, um, you know, what's what has been going on here? Well, you know, I'm not going to go into a whole discussion of monetary policy tonight. But we have referenced many times, and Lyndon LaRouche referenced many, many times, the decision by the Nixon administration to end the Bretton Woods system in 1971, uh, um, uh, to uh, usher in an era of floating exchange rates, um, you know, ending the gold reserve system, ending our, our stable trade relations with other nations, uh, and and you know and and they began to bring in, um, you know, through a process of deregulation, you know, uh, they transformed our financial system from one and our monetary system 
from one which was stable uh, with whatever problems it had. Uh, uh, it was transformed entirely into a system of financial gambling, of usury, of speculation. Um, you know, and this has resulted in the kind of situation we have now today where people can't distinguish money from actual societal wealth. Um, the, um, and this is what happened to places like Gary and to many other cities and towns. Um, all of a sudden, investment into production stopped. All of a sudden, jobs were moved overseas. All of a sudden, uh, the banks, the hedge funds, the, you know, et cetera, et cetera, um, began to pouring money into financial speculation, financial gambling, as opposed to investing it into um, into the uh, um, productive economy. Then in 1979, this is while Jimmy Carter was president. Uh, you know, the Council on Foreign Relations and the Trilateral Commission, you know, which are these Wall Street elite, New York based elite, you know, oligarchical interests. Um, the Trilateral Commission and the Council on Foreign Relations began to organize around something they called the 1980s project. And they issued dozens of pamphlets and reports and it was it was a big deal you know people like cyrus vance were involved and all, all these top people top people in the carter administration and you know what they said was that um you know the uh, uh the era of america's you know dominance in manufacturing and technology was coming to an end and that we had to recognize that and what they called for, and they actually used this term, I'm not paraphrasing it, they called for what uh, controlled disintegration of the US economy, controlled disintegration. And that same year, that, you know, that, that report was issued in 1979, <laughs> and that same year, and going into 1980, uh, Paul Volcker, you know, uh, at the Federal Reserve, um, began the process of shock therapy, uh, you know, where uh, over a very short period of time, as, as people old enough will recall, interest rates were raised to over 20% in the United States. And, you know, the raising of interest rates to over 20% combined with the push to um, send U.S. manufacturing jobs overseas, which then picked up steam, you know, several years later with NAFTA. Um, but all of this, um, this was a death blow to U.S. manufacturing, to U.S. production. And what happened is that these cities and towns were left to die. If you had enough money, you fled to the sub suburbs and maybe tried to get a job, who knows? Real estate, banking, some other useless occupation. Um, or, uh, uh, you know, and those that couldn't get out of the cities were left there. Now, a lot of people who consider themselves Republicans, you know, might say, well, that's all very interesting, but uh, who cares? Yeah, I empathize with these people, you know, but who cares? You know, um, I mean, Gary, Indiana today is 80 percent black. And it voted for, uh, you know, Biden. It's a it's a Democratic city, Democratic, you know, hellhole, you know, another one of the Democratic Party urban plantations, you know, uh, whereas people get poorer and poorer. You know, the Democratic Party officials give them money and bribe them to vote for the Democratic Party. Um, so you could say, well, we can't, you know, these people are not going to be on our side in the, in the 2024 election. They're all going to vote Democratic again. Now, I think that's, uh, uh, you know, 
a terrible attitude if anyone holds that attitude you know let's forget gary let's forget flint michigan let's forget newark new jersey let's forget baltimore you know you know um you know the fact is that these are people in these cities who 60 years ago were productive americans raising families producing things that were useful for the nation as a whole and they were deliberately consciously destroyed by policies coming out of london and wall street etc um and then they were abandoned they're americans just like the people on this call they're americans um you know and uh it is to me morally reprehensible to just sort of write these people off you know um you know i mean there's this thing about bleeding heart liberals you know you want to be a bleeding heart liberal well look the problem is you know most liberals are not bleeding uh, you know their their hearts don't bleed you know i mean watch these uh young white liberals in in the cities they just step over homeless people while they're you know eating their morning croissant um they don't care about them um you know the uh watch you know i mean in the last two years i believe more than 100,000 americans have died of drug overdoses 100,000 americans have died of drug overdoses so in two years we've lost triple the amount of people we lost in the vietnam war in two years and the liberals don't care about these people dying of drug overdose overdoses they want to legalize more drugs george soros wants to legalize more drugs the attorney general of california wants to legalize more drugs and they want to set up you know injection centers you know where they'll hand everyone a syringe and what have you you can come in and under government supervision and you know inject your drugs into your veins you know this is not a bleeding heart liberal these people are murderers that's what they are they're anti-human the fact is you know um we should care about these people because they're american citizens and we should uh, and we should act accordingly now the um look you know i mean the, yeah the, the drugs thing is the same thing i mean look we, you know the problem we have at this point you know this question of cultural and economic you know we you know we're not going to get anywhere until we take economic sovereignty back from the globalist bankers you know you know from the world economic forum crowd from the federal reserve from the central bankers you know if you look at the systematic destruction of the productive economy in the united states over the last 40 to 50 years none of which was inevitable none of which had to have happened it was done deliberately and if you if you want to reverse that there is no way to reverse it unless we abolish the federal reserve you know unless we go back to a hamiltonian national banking system unless we unless uh, we issue hundreds of billions if not trillions of dollars in productive credit to rebuild our infrastructure our manufacturing our energy our water facilities you know um and you know things like that uh you know trump has proposed building 10 new cities you know and that is a terrific idea but you know the, the uh, you know the so you know the, in many ways the fight is economic but you know the um it's not just economic as i look it, it's it, you you can't just look at it that way and you know i i, I said to someone the other day that um it's really all cultural because if you're an oligarch you know 
if your view of humanity is that human beings are just beasts to be exploited, you know, to be ripped off, you know, uh, uh, to be oppressed, you know, and that you're part of the elite crowd. Well, if that's your view, you know, then uh, your economic policies are going to reflect that view. On the other hand, you know, if you're someone like Benjamin Franklin or George Washington, you know, or Abraham Lincoln, and your view is that um, all human beings are born, are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that we are not animals, that we are made in God's image, that the purpose of the founding of our republic was to create a nation, a republic, which recognized, you know, that idea of human nature, that we were no longer going to live under an oligarchy, you know, um, uh, but that we were going to be free to develop, you know, based on the creative nature of what it means to be human. Well, if that's your view, then that's going to determine a different kind of economic policy. And that's what the fight has been about since 1775. You know, that is what the fight has been about. And, you know, the British still have this view, you know. And why don't you, do you have that picture that I emailed or did you not? Get yeah, that? I got it. Yeah, put it up. Just to, Coming right up. There we go. You know. Here, 2023, 2023, and this is, you know, the newly crowned king of, you know, the United Kingdom of Great Britain, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, and all of the other British possessions around the world, and the head of the British Commonwealth, uh, you know, whose likeness also is still on the money, I believe in Australia and New Zealand and Canada. I mean, some of these countries are starting to take it off the money. Now, people say, well, this is just pomp. This is just for the tourists. You know, this is just sort of a, you know, humorous relic of the past. But let us not forget that, you know, uh, King, you know uh, King Charles' father, Prince Philip, was the founder of the World Wildlife Fund, you know, which was the first major group founded to enforce, you know, calling for policies of human depopulation, you know, human depopulation, you know, and let's not also forget that, um, you know, King Charles is a regular participant and has spoken frequently at the annual conferences of the World Economic Forum in Davos. You know, this is an imperial outlook. You don't count. I don't count. The people in Gary, Indiana don't count. Let them die. Let them suffer with massive infusion of drugs and decay, you know, as long as the elites still run the world. So we have to break their power. We have to break it. This is not a question of, you know, um, legislation or policy proposals. I mean, we'll need legislation, but we have to abolish the Federal Reserve. We have to, you know, get out of the World Trade Organization. You know, we have to, um, uh, uh, you know, get out of the central banking system. We have to sit down with countries that we're now on the verge of going to war with, like Russia and China, and other countries like India and say, hey, let's stop all this foolishness of free trade and financial speculation, and let's negotiate a new gold-backed, you know, uh, monetary system, you know, uh, and let's, you know, let's have a fair and equitable economics and economic development in the world. We have to do these things. We have to break loose, you know. Now, you know, this, you know, brings me to you know, one of the things I'm going to sort of conclude with here, because, you know, 
I mean, sometimes when you say, you know, we have pessimism in the country, people get all freaked out because they, you know, everyone wants to believe that, you know, there's millions of good people out there and we're going to rally the country and we're going to get Trump back in the White House. And that's, you know, we stand a good chance of doing that. But the fact is, enormous damage has been done to the American people in the last 30 to 40 years. You know, and what we're seeing now, which is probably not even the worst of it, because if we're seeing this now, imagine what we're going to see, you know, in five years if Biden were to get back in for a second term. But what we're seeing now with this transgenderism and all of this stuff, you know, this is all a product of the absolute destruction of the nation, you know, over the, uh, uh, you know, over the, over the last, you know, 40 to 50 years. You know, um, when you talk about drugs, you know, people like to talk about, oh, well, people don't like to talk about it, but what is often uh, focused on, you know, is, well, it was opioids, now it's fentanyl, but is the drug overdoses, the amount of people being killed, you know, um, being murdered, really, through a deliberate policy of, you know, massive drug, you know, importation. Um, you know, and, and the numbers are, what can you say, um, horrifying, but, uh, you know, I want to point out a, a, a different kind of problem because in my view, as horrifying as the drug deaths are, you know, what is, when, if, if you think about this question of a civilizational crisis, what is worse in my view, is the amount of drug usage. Um, I mean, the uh, you know, I, I spent some time digging into this, and it's very hard to find accurate numbers, and it's very hard to find numbers, you know, that are up to date, you know, 2022, let alone 2023, even 2020. Because if you look at numbers that are five, you know, five years old or 10 years old or 15 years old. The fact is, it's all it's escalating. The drug usage and the crisis is escalating dramatically, and every state that has legalized marijuana has has found this out. You know, um, an explosion of drug usage. You know, but it is, um, you know, it, it is minimally, minimally, twenty five to thirty percent of the American people are on drugs right now every day now they were not all illegal drugs i mean a lot of places marijuana is legal you know and they want to legalize you know hallucinogens and then you, of course you got the opioids and fentanyl and crack cocaine and all this stuff but i'm also talking about you know the legal drugs and some people you know get really you know their back gets up on this because you know maybe some people take them i don't care i don't know you know but if you take, uh, you know, uh, start with the prescription of, um, you know, uh, Ritalin, Adderall, and other things designed, you know, for children and high school children, grade school children, um, you know, to fight, you know, alleged things like attention deficit disorder. Um, if you take things like antidepressants, if you take things like antipsychotic drugs, and you, know, you could say, well, someone taking an antidepressant is not as bad as someone taking fentanyl. Well, you're not going to drop dead tomorrow. No. And you'll probably be able to function, you know, somewhat, you know, and, you know, get through life. But what is the overall effect here? You know, I mean, what does it say about our republic? The, 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 you know, the, the nature of our culture in 2023, if 30% of our people can't get, make it through a day without taking some kind of mind altering uh, medication or drug, that they need drugs just to cope, just to cope, you know? just to get through the day. What does that say about your culture? 
what it says to me is that we have a crisis of pessimism, that we have a crisis of people who have lost faith in the future. Lost faith in the future are just trying to get through life, but really have no hope for a better society, you know, for a productive society in which your life means something. You know, and look, this is the question of the United States. And, and I'll just conclude by saying, you know, this is a civilizational crisis. Everything is collapsing. None of these short-term solutions are going to work. The Fed's going to raise interest rates. The Fed's going to lower interest rates. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. Forget it. You know, um, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, you know, we have tens of millions of people in this country who are trapped in a downward spiral, and it's going to get worse. Um, we have uh, most of the major financial institutions, you know, uh, in the world, uh, you know, particularly in London, Wall Street, you know, Switzerland, the offshore banks, the hedge funds, they're, you know, they're in they're all financial, they're all bankrupt. There's nothing backing them up. It's all a pyramid scheme, you know, of, of financial speculation. We have the Biden administration driving towards war with both Russia and China. We are in a civilizational crisis. And, you know, I raised the point, I think at the beginning, and I'm gonna end with this again, is it possible to intervene into such a crisis and turn it around? Rome was followed by centuries of collapse. You know, Italy was followed by, you know, you know, in the 14th and 15th century by starvation, disease, collapse, and the Black Death. Half the people died. The same thing happened in China, in India, in other civilizations. Arab, the Arab Renaissance you know, uh, which some people might know some about. They all collapsed. And in many cases, they never again arose to the same height or it took them a long time or they never did it at all. So my question is, in a crisis like this, is it possible to intervene into the crisis today? Is it possible to intervene and turn this around? Or do we have to suffer the fate of Rome or one of the other, you know, civilizations? Do we have to go through a, a period in which the human population drops to 1 billion people on the planet? And then hopefully 200 years from now, someone will, you know, begin to, uh, get something good going again. Do we have to do that? You know, um, and if you look at human history, it hasn't happened very often where such a crisis and such a collapse uh, were successfully addressed and turned around. Now, what I mentioned in my article um, is if you wanna understand, or at least in my, this is my view, if you want to look at an instance of where this was done, where a crisis of profound proportions was turned around, then look to the American Revolution. Because, you know, uh, and people say, well, what, what, what crisis? What are you talking about? Well, I mean, first of all, in the hundred years leading up to 1775, the British Empire was the leading slave trading uh, uh, empire in the world. It controlled the transatlantic slave trade. You know, most of the slaves who were taken out of Africa were taken out in the hundred years that the British ran the slave trade. And then by 1775, they were already beginning to shift into um the uh, uh, narcotics trafficking, opium, you know, which over the next hundred years destroyed China. 
largely destroyed India. And India was a very advanced country, and the British drove it backwards and killed tens of millions of Indians. They looted and destroyed the world. And in the 19th century, they set up this, their central banking system, and they created you know, the, the most powerful financial colossus, the most powerful financial empire in human history. So this was a crisis. And in 1775, Benjamin Franklin, George Washington, and many other good people, too many to name, said, no, we're not going down that path. We're not going to submit to that kind of imperial rule and economic looting because, you know, the British wanted to outlaw manufacturing in the colonies, among other things, and spread slavery in the colonies. Um, and, uh, you know, pe people said no. Now, it's not enough to just say no. You know, if you are going to um, overcome a crisis of this type, you have to define a new type of culture, a new type of society, which is based on higher principles than the culture that's collapsing. And that's what they did. That's exactly what they did. And if you look at the Declaration of Independence, where we, endow we are endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights, this defines a notion of what it means to be a human being. And then they founded a republic based on those principles, that understanding of human culture. They founded a republic based on that. Um, and this was a, you know, you know, it, it was an entirely different approach to human society. They created a new type of human society, a new type of human culture. You know, and there, you know, if you look at European history, there have been many, many great people in European history, many uh, profound scientists, many creative people, many moral people. But the Europeans never escaped from oligarchical rule. Never to this day, you know, and, you know, the uh, um, this is what is truly different. This is the real definition, not the bad definition. This is the real definition of American exceptionalism. It's not that we're exceptional because of, for some racial reason or geographic reason or imperial reason. We're better than everyone else in the world. No. But it's that we, we founded a republic based on higher principles of how human society should be organized and, and the absolute sacredness of human life, committing the nation to defend that, to defend the general welfare, to advance society, to give opportunity to everyone. And you don't throw anyone overboard. You know, the uh, uh, anyone, you throw no one overboard because this is a government of the people. So, um, you know, this is what we have to revive, you know, this is what this nation is all about. You know, it's not about, let, let's have a bunch of, you know, bullet points, you know, hot button issues, you know, you know, that we can, we can push buttons in the election. This is what DeSantos is trying to do. You ever notice with DeSantos, some, something will break, something big in the news will break, you know, and Trump will respond to it within 24 hours. DeSantos, it's usually like five days later or seven days later that he comes out with a statement like Tucker Carlson being fired. Because what he's doing is he's huddling 
with his campaign advisors to see, you know, you know, what he should say that will work the best politically for him. That would that will give him a boost in the polls, right? And you know, um, if we have leaders like that, then we're not going to overcome this crisis. We're not. You have to have leaders with courage. You're taking on the financial oligarchy. You're taking on the World Economic Forum crowd. You have to have leaders with courage and vision. And that's what this fight is about. And I tell you, the extent to which, you know, you demonstrate to people that vision of the future and that courage to fight for that, um, then there's no constituency in the United States, you know, who you should write off. You know, um, you'd be insane to do that because, you know, you know, it, it's not people's fault that they're taking drugs. You could say, you know, you have people make individual decisions to take drugs or not. Sure, that's true. That's absolutely true. But you're going to blame the millions of people who died in China during the opium war on, on, on China when the British are bringing in boatload after boatload after boatload after boatload after boatload of opium and shipping it everywhere and bribing government officials to distribute it, you know, um, and then and then even enforcing it with guns with the two opium wars. So you're going to blame the opium smokers for the problem? It's an imperial empire, you know, an imperial elite. Imperial empire is redundant, but it's this is what this is what we're fighting. You know, uh, and, um, you know, the first thing that people have got to do is to actually have the courage to recognize the scope of the crisis we're in, because it's much worse than, than most people want to admit to themselves. And the second thing is to think through what is it going to take to rescue our nation and really to rescue the whole world, to pull back from the brink and go in an entirely different direction, an entirely different direction, a revolutionary, uh, you know, direction. What is it going to take to do that? And that's what we need to rally people around, in my view. Um, so I don't know. That's uh uh, that's my fill-in for uh, Miwa, so I think I'll stop right there, okay?